Today, I'm going to be reading Chapter 7 of Ground Zero by Alan Gratz. The chapter is titled, In Case of Emergency. A motion sensor picked up Brandon climbing out of the hole in the wall, and the fluorescent lights in the ceiling flickered on. He had landed in the middle of a bathroom, a ladies' bathroom, but Brandon didn't have time to embar- to embarrass to be embarrassed. He scrambled to his feet and peered back through the hole at the people still trapped in the elevator. I'll bring help, he promised, and he ran for the bathroom door. Brandon burst out into a corridor. He ran past a fire extinguisher and a fire hose box hanging on the wall, and into the first office he came to a company with the name Hagudo Bank printed on the door. He saw a reception desk and a couple of chairs for visitors, but no one was around. Hello, Brandon called. There was no there was no smoke here. He pulled down the wet napkin, he tied it around his face, and took a deep breath of fresh air. Is anyone here? We need help. Brandon ran f- past the reception desk. A small group of people stood together at the far wall, staring out the window at something. Hey, Brandon said, running towards them. Hey, we need help. Brandon stopped short, mesmerized by what he saw out the window. Paper. The sky was filled with thousands and thousands of sheets of paper, flipping and falling like the ticker tape parade when the Yankees won the World Series last year. But this wasn't right. No one could have thrown all these papers out a window on purpose. The World Trade Center's windows didn't open. Large chunks of glass and metal sliced through the paper blizzard, and some kind of liquid poured down the side of the building, even though it wasn't raining. Brennan's stomach twisted. Something very bad had happened above them in the North Tower. But what and how high up? All the way up the windows on the floor. Was Brandon's dad all right? Gas explosions, one of the bankers said. Has to be. No way, said another banker. The road training center doesn't have gas lines in it. Please, we need help, Brandon cut in, asking them jump. Four people trapped in an elevator. There's a lot of smoke. Where, kid? A man asked. I'll show you. Two men and one woman from the group followed Brandon back down the hall and into the bathroom. Brandon was almost afraid to look through through the hole. What if the elevator had fallen while he was gone? What if everyone inside was dead? Dark black smoke poured from the hole, making it hard to see, but Brandon heard St- Stephen cough, and he sagged with relief. His friends were in- still there. Oh my gosh, said one of the men who'd come with Brandon. Here, get back, the other banker said. The two men took turns kicking at the drywall, and the woman ran back to the office to call 911. Brandon heard the ele- elevator car drop suddenly, di- dishes clattered, and everyone inside cried out for surprise and terror. The car jerked to a stop a foot lower, but Brandon held his breath. If the car dropped too much further, the passengers wouldn't be able to reach the hole. And if it fell down all the way, hurry, Brandon told the men, we have to get them out. The bankers were kick- kicking at the drywall as hard as and fast as they could but they were already panning hard and sweating through their shirt dra- their dress shirts. The smoke was getting worse, too. Brandon coughed and looked around frankly, frank, frank, frantically. He had something to do. The help he'd brought wasn't enough, and they hadn't have time to wait for building security or firemen. Firemen, Brandon thought. Then all of a sudden, inspiration. He ran back into the hall. There, a fire hose box. Brandon didn't want to, the hose curled up around inside it, he wanted what was in front of the hose, right behind the glass, a fire axe. The instructions on the window said, in case of emergency, break glass. Well, thought Brandon, if there ever was an emergency, this is it. He yanked the fire extinguisher from its cradle and used the heavy thing like a battering ram. Ksh! The glass scat- scattered, and Brandon cleared out the rest of the shards enough to reach inside. He grazed his wrist on a piece of glass and pulled it his arm away with a hiss, but he'd be he'd be all right. He'd had worse injuries wiping out on his skateboard. The important thing was he had an axe. Brandon ran back into the, the bathroom where there was two bankers standing bent over, their hands on, the, on their knees. They were out of breath and the smoke was even thicker than before. Look out, Brandon cried. Shaking from panic and fear, Brandon lifted the big axe over his head and stung it down hard and r- racked, breaking in the drywall. Whack! The axe knocked off a chunk of sheetrock, 
but Brandon didn't hit it square on. The axe kicked away from the wall and slammed into the floor below. A whole clank scattered the bathroom tiles. Whoa, 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 one of the bankers said, taking the axe from Brandon. Good job, kid, but I got it from here. Brandon stood up, stood back as the man swung the axe at the wall. He was stronger, and his aim was better. In less than a minute, he had opened a big hole enough for the Marnie to squeeze through. When she could stand again, she wrapped Brandon in a I can't believe we're alive hug. Ordinarily, Brandon would have felt funny hugging a stranger, but now he hugged her back with relief. Mike and Shavender were able to help Stephen get through the hole next. He was still having trouble breathing, and Marnie went to get him water. Finally, Mike and Shavender squeezed through the hole, and then everyone was out of the horrible elevator. Shavender gave Brandon a high tug. You saved us, Brandon, he said. Brandon pointed to the men from the bank. They did, they did the work. Brandon, with the axe, wiped the sweat from his brow and smiled. I guess chopping all that wood as a kid in Wisconsin paid off, he said. Marnie tried her cell phone again, and this time she got a signal. She stepped to the corner of the bathroom with a finger to one ear and her phone to the other. Does anyone know what happened, Shavender asked the bankers. Felt like an earthquake to me, one of them replied. Yes, yes, I'm all right, Marnie told someone on the phone. The signal's bad. Han, I can't. Yes, we're trapped in an elevator, but she was quiet for a moment. Oh my gosh, she said. She turned her face to the rest of them. My husband says an airplane hit the building. A, ma a passenger jet. It's all over the news. My God, Stephen said. That must be why the building tilted. We were in the elevator when the plane hit. A plane hit the building? Brandon felt a jolt go through him. That didn't make sense. How could you fly a plane into one of the one of the Twin Towers by accident. They were the biggest, tallest buildings in the city, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. No pilot in his right mind would. Screech! Brandon heard the sound of metal grinding against the metal, and he flinched. He and the others glanced back at the hole, just in time to see the elevator car plummet down the shaft. Nobody moved, and nobody spoke. Everyone was waiting and listening for the elevator car to hit the bottom, but the crash never came. Or maybe it was so far down that they couldn't hear it. Br Brandon exhaled and slumped forward. Mike cursed underneath his breath, and Stephen let out a single sob. They had come that close to pummeling to their deaths. Han, I call you back when I get out, Marnie said into her phone, and I flipped it closed. In a daze, Brandon followed everyone out of the bathroom. The two bankers went back to their office, and the elevator survivors stood in a huddle. The plane must have hit somewhere high up, Mike said quietly, cut through the elevator cables. My dad, Brandon said suddenly, he's in the windows on the world. The plane hit the 107th floor. He exchanged a, f a frantic glance at Chavender, with Stephen eyes searched the ceiling. My company spread out over five floors. What if it hit one of those? Marty put her hand to her mouth. My company covers eight, eight floors right above us. And there were a half a dozen people at work already in this morning. I'm sure they're all right, Mike said. But there was no way he could know that. Brandon thought. There was no way any of them could know what floor the plane had hit. One of the bankers came back from his office. Claudia got 911 on the phone. He reported. They said to stay put and wait for, fire, for the firemen. Mike shook his head. Not me. I'm done. I think I'm escaping that elevator to... I think I'm es escaping. That elevator deserves taking the rest of the day off. The other elevator survivors nodded. I am not getting into another elevator. Maybe ever, Shavender said. He gestured to the door and, and led to the stairway. It's 85 flights of stairs down or 22 flights up. Up? Oh, why would we go up if that's where the plane had hit? Asked Mike. The stairs might, have, might still be clear and they can't take us off the roof. Off the roof in helicopters, Shavender explained. They did it once in 93, and it's a lot shorter trip. I left my purse and things in my office, said Marnie. You can come back and get them tomorrow, Shavender told her. Stephen coughed. I can't go up, he said. I'm sorry, I'm still having trouble breathing. I'll help you go down, no worry, said Mike. So will I, Shavender said. Stephen nodded gratefully, and each man took one of Stephen's arms and shoulders uh, Stephen's arms over their shoulders. 
Marnie followed them. The bankers decided to stay. Nobody asked Brandon what he wanted to do. Maybe they all just assumed he would go along with the group from the elevator. But then he entered the stairwell. Everyone else started going down. Brandon knew he couldn't go with them. He kept hearing his dad's voice in his head. Brandon, what do we say about this? About you and me? We're a team, Brandon said aloud. That's how we survive, together. Brandon tied the wet napkin around his face and started to climb the stairs up to windows on the world. That's all for today. Thank you for listening.